this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. Is America under attack? Is America facing self-destruction to which President Lincoln was referring? Will America's history be written as a script for national suicide? The evidence of that fearful potential is upon America's doorstep. Duplicitous teachings embedded in K through 12 schools, college campuses, the military, and corporations across the nation are confronting America in a face-to-face -face battle for truth. You know, we have to make a decision here as to whether we're going to not look at the organizations or the things they say they want to do uh, because it's awkward to talk about race, or if we're going to really do the things that will improve the lives of all Americans, including African Americans. Children are falling prey to a beguiling education under the guise of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The history of this nation is being challenged and prosecuted for being systematically racist. Political groups are indoctrinating young minds with nefarious teachings and injecting their hatred for this country into the veins and arteries of America. A revolution is underway. A revolution that threatens the very freedoms this nation has stood for for more than 200 years. This revolution is dividing America. And it was Abraham Lincoln who declared, a house divided against itself cannot stand. This undertaking will expose political revolutionaries who are attempting to tear down the American Constitution, rewrite its history, inflict a blow to capitalism, and forever destroy this nation's way of life. Lincoln, with prophetic vision, warned that if destruction is America's destiny, it would not come by a foreign power, but by self-destruction from those living within its borders that reality is taking root. The root is critical race theory. The target is our children in schools across the nation. It is the blueprint for national suicide. It is race Marxism. It is Marxist theory taken out of economic class and put into race. So the idea Quoting from Gloria Ladsden Billings in 1995, she said that the point of critical race theory is to make race the central construct for understanding inequality. For Marxism, it's making economic class the central construct for understanding inequality, and then working to change society around that belief. So critical race theory is race Marxism. It's that same idea that you're gonna have a conflict across racial difference, you're gonna alienate racial minority groups against whiteness, which it then scapegoats. People who have access to whiteness are the problem. 
They have to interrogate their whiteness. They have to figure out what it means to be white. And that agitation, that conflict, is the same Marxism that the proletariat and the bourgeoisie were put into, that same exact conflict that we saw, you know, early 1900s that led to the Russian Revolution and so on. Now it's just race instead of class. In order to understand critical race theory, it's important to know its origins, which were born from critical theory. Critical theory was conceived at the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research in 1929 with German philosophers and social theorists working collaboratively and examining Marxism in every detail. The principal philosopher was Max Horkheimer. After leaving his father's textile manufacturing business, Horkheimer decided to follow his passion for teaching philosophy. Once he received his PhD, he lectured extensively on 18th and 19th century philosophy with a strong interest in Marxian themes. You really have to go back to Germany in the 1930s when uh, Marxist intellectuals were asking themselves why uh, the worker was not constantly revolting and overthrowing capitalism, why the proletariat was not overthrowing the bourgeoisie, which is what Marx and Engels had called for, has said would happen because of the inconsistencies of capitalism. In 1930, Horkheimer was appointed professor of social philosophy at the Frankfurt Institute. The Institute began as a Marxist study group started by Felix Wheel, a one-time student of political science who used his financial inheritance to fund an institution that would support his Marxist academic ideals. After Adolf Hitler was named Germany's chancellor in 1933, the Institute was closed and its building seized by the Gestapo. The Frankfurt Institute interfered with Hitler's rising Nazi movement. Horkheimer, as a German Jew, was threatened, but continued his philosophical work in Los Angeles where he received American citizenship during World War II. There, he helped launch studies in prejudice. Following the war, Horkheimer moved back to Germany where his contemporary work gained steam before he died in 1973. The fundamental elements of Horkheimer's views and teachings, though it did not mention Karl Marx specifically, it was his work squarely aimed at the repair of social problems and alleviating economic suffering. Horkheimer's entire works included critiquing and changing society. It was to generate a revolution criticizing capitalism and seeking equity in all social classes. Ja, diese Soziologie war äh, ein Hinausgehen über die kritische Lehre von der Gesellschaft durch Marx, äh, die der Wirklichkeit mehr angemessen war. Denn jetzt äh, ist eine Sache, glaube ich, sehr wichtig. Der Marx hatte das Ideal der Gesellschaft freier Menschen. Er glaubte, dass diese kapitalistische Gesellschaft notwendig über die durch das steigende Elend der Arbeiter bedingte Solidarität sein müsse. Diese Idee ist falsch. Die, diese Gesellschaft, in der wir leben, verelendet nicht die Arbeiter, sondern hilft ihnen zu einem besseren Dasein. Und außerdem hat der Marx gar nicht gesehen, dass Freiheit und Gerechtigkeit dialektische Begriffe sind. Je mehr Freiheit, desto weniger Gerechtigkeit. Und je mehr Gerechtigkeit, desto weniger Freiheit. In der kritischen Theorie, äh, wie ist sie dann auch später noch entwickelt habe, liegt der Gedanke zugrunde, dass man das, was gut ist, also die gute, die freie Gesellschaft, in der Gesellschaft, in der wir jetzt leben, nicht bestimmen kann. Dazu, dazu fehlt es uns. Aber wir können die negativen Seiten dieser Gesellschaft, die wir verändern wollen, 
Horkheimer's solution was to create a rational social order, which is described in terms of a socialist planned economy. In other words, an improved form of Marxism. When you have the German Marxists coming out of Germany to the United States in the 1930s, promoting this idea that there is oppression between economic classes, as well as a very vague sense of Freudian postmodernism where there's no authentic truth, as they combine that, and then it moves into law schools where law professors start to say, all right, let's take a critical look at American law, and we will say that American law is oppressive, right, because the Western canon is oppressive. You add on to, uh, onto that the ideas of Franz Fanon and decolonization, which says that, well, we have to remove anything that is not ethnically original to whatever area we're talking about. And then you add again the, the race component, the critical race component. You can also add a gender or sexual orientation component to that as well, right? You can add feminist related components to it as well. So you suddenly, you have this critical perspective in which there is no uh, authentic truth. There are no values or core ideas on which we can base society. So that throws the traditional understanding of man and woman and marriage out the window. There, there is what the Italians, what Antonio Gramsci, the Italian founder of the Communist Party, called a hegemonic narrative and what the Germans called a, 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 a conceptual superstructure, which was ruling how the workers thought, uh, that, that the worker had bought into uh, the ideas uh, of, the, of the ruling class, they had bought into the family, they had bought into the nation state, they were religious, they liked God, uh, they, they didn't want to dismantle capitalism. They had what they called false consciousness. And a theory was needed. The role of the intellectual, of the Marxist intellectual then was to change the consciousness of the worker, um, uh, give him a revolutionary consciousness. They come to the US, they become really influential. The Germans do, the, 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 the scholars of the Frankfurt School. In the US, the people who listen to them, uh, the New Left create critical legal theory, which says the superstructure is embedded into the law, uh, into uh, the, 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 the powerful and the rich write the law to perpetuate their wealth and their power. And then eventually in the 80s, uh, and they're called critical legal theorists, these people who write that the, 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 the superstructure is, is written into the law. And then some critical th legal theorists of color begin to attend their conferences and to have disagreement and say, all of this is true, there's a superstructure and it wants to perpetuate its wealth and power, but they, all, they also have one thing in common, they're all white. And, and, and what they want to perpetuate is their white supremacy. And you're not seeing that, they're saying to, their, to the other critical legal theorists who are white, it's because you're white. Eventually, they start calling themselves critical race theorists. To, to, to separate themselves from the critical legal theorists or the critical legal scholars, and they become dominant in, 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 on campus. They, 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 they win. They, 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 they win the argument with the critical legal theorists. They, they, they expel them from the field of civil rights, but they remain in universities. Both Marxism and Horkheimer's philosophy in critical theory were never about merely teaching people or bringing to light the elements of fairness and equity. It was not about educating a better way of life. These philosophies created by Marx, Weil, Horkheimer, and others demanded action through radical change. Change that would be brought about by revolutionaries. Revolutionaries like civil rights activist Malcolm X, who said, all of us who might have probed space or cured cancer, or built industries, were instead black victims of the white man's American social system. He also declared people involved in a revolution don't become part of the system, they destroy the system. Very clear about the fact that they wanted it to be a, a way to overthrow society. They wanted it to be a, a, a discipline that would not remain in the in, 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 in the faculty lounge, who would be used to dismantle society and revolutionize society. Marxism is a social, political, and economic philosophy that examines the effects of capitalism and argues for overturning capitalism in favor of communism. 
Marxism had to change in the mid 20th century. So what we have is this issue. If you kind of go back in time, we're in the 1960s, we're, we're Marxists, we're looking at the world and we have a problem. And the problem is very simple. Marx was wrong. Capitalism works. And in fact, you have these big thinkers, these big Marxist thinkers of the 60s saying, Marx said that capitalism would immiserate the workers, but it allows them to build a better life. That's Max Horkheimer. He said that in 1969 in an interview. You have Herbert Marcuse saying that, that advanced capitalism has stabilized the working class. So what, is, what do they say that we have to do? We need a new working class. That's what they called it, a new working class, a new proletariat, a new base for radical agitation. And where were they gonna find it? Well, Herbert Marcuse, kind of the leading thinker of the 1960s radical Marxism movement, said we look to the ghetto population. That's where he started. So we look to the black radicals. He's looking at the black power movement. He says, those people, have the vital energy needed to have a revolution in this country. And so, but they're not enough. What else do we need? Well, we need to get the students. We need to get the students and radicalize the students. So we're gonna go into the colleges and start radicalizing students on racial politics so that we can use them to kind of minister to the so-called ghetto population that he wants to agitate to revolutionary action. He says, we need to get the feminists. The feminists are already halfway Marxist anyway. Let's bring them into this kind of new way of thinking where they have to think about race and class and all of these things going together. And he started cobbling together the sexual minorities, the racial minorities, the feminists, the unemployed, the outsiders, the radicals, like the weather underground. We have to put these people all together and they're gonna be a new working class because the actual working class, which Marxism is always claim to care about and represent is now stable. It's now, a con they said it in fact, in, the, in their own words, it's a stable conservative counter-revolutionary force. They have a better life. They have a good life. This is what the Marxists in the 1960s were, were, were facing, is basically that capitalism works. Marx was wrong. So what are we going to do? We're going to move into identity politics. It was noted by Nelson Mandela that education is the key to changing the world. And Marxist radicals in the 1960s and 70s knew this better than anyone. In the 1970s then, what we had was this, this thing that's called the critical turn in education. Basically, critical Marxism was getting brought by the scholarly theorists into the schools of education. Uh, it started by bringing in Marxist theorists of education like Paulo Freire, a Brazilian Marxist who believed that teachers and students had to be made equal or you don't have a properly democratic classroom so all of a sudden you see this theme that we have now that the students are going to lead the class they're going to determine the curriculum you know they're going to be put on equal with the teacher and the teacher doesn't have any authority over the student that goes right back to a, a brazilian marxist uh, from the 1960s and 70s that got brought in in the 1970s and 80s into north american schools of education um, eventually what happened was all of these kind of critical theorists started bringing in the post-structural feminist stuff, which sounds fancy and complicated, but that's where all the trans stuff falls out of now today. All of this kind of very radical, you know, 200 genders, 200 sexualities, everybody has to find their meaning by dissolving any sense of solid identity and having a gender fluid identity that changes from here to there or the other place. That all comes in with post-structural feminism where anything that's normal turns out to be bad and oppressive and has to be challenged and rebuked. And then a third kind of twist of that screw in the critical turn of education is documented as the introduction in the late 90s of critical race theory into education, which was done in order to bring the racial component of this kind of identity Marxist thought into schools. And so you kind of have this three-stage process that happened, Marxist theory first, then bringing in weird post-structural, everything's up for grabs feminism, and then bringing in critical race theory and going full intersectional, which is the model that you see today. Some of the complaints that I've heard from school teachers is, is the fact that they have to incorporate these types of things into their curriculum. Those that are pushing it from the district level, a lot of times don't even agree with CRT but there's some agenda at play that they have to implement for some reason. And so they're, they're trying to pick and choose what out of all of this garbage could I find that might be something that I could actually say without you know, going against my own ethical fabric. And, and that, that's, a, that's a strange position to be in. It's like, well, find something in all of this that you can support and let's just, and let's just go with that instead of 
what is what makes sense and what what can you honestly embrace they're they're being forced to embrace something about CRT and implement at least that little bit which is the you know the camel and the the camel getting his nose in the tent and as soon as they get that little piece then it starts to expand which is exactly what the purveyors want it to do on the scholarly side of things you had these kind of Marxist theorists realizing that if you could get into the schools, not just the colleges and universities, but the schools of education, the teaching colleges, then what you can do is teach the teachers so that you have an entire new generation of students. And then another generation later, all the teachers become Marxist or at least, you know, sympathetic to Marxist thought. And then you have an, another, another generation of kids that are going to be sympathetic to Marxist thought. You do this for 30, 40, 50 years, you know, a few generations down, and all you have now is an entire education system that's redwashed. It's preparing people to become Marxist for when the Marxist revolution maybe gets sprung or whatever, they're sympathetic to those ideas. Injecting radical theory in the school system has been the preferred method of indoctrination. But because this slow drip of critical theory has more recently included intersectionality components, parents nationwide are objecting. I um, composed an email that Tuesday saying, I have looked into the laws, I have looked into these curriculum rules. I do not believe you are allowed to teach these topics without parental consent. And if you do not send home a parental permission slip, I will be pushing this to a higher level. We're coming back. We're going to come back together strong. And this will not be the last, you know, of them seeing me. And I just joined every organization that I could that was standing for America. There's a foundational issue that is the loss of parental rights. Parents are being pushed out of the system step by step. They can't get into the classrooms like they should. They don't know what's going on in those classrooms. It's only fortunate that once in a while some student records what happened in the classroom that anybody has any idea of what's really taking place. This morning, a big story. A teacher on administrative leave in the Alpine School District after just the first day of school. Yeah, the year just started, right? The Alpine School District saying it has put a teacher on leave after a video emerged online of the teacher going on a politically loaded rant. I hate Donald Trump. I'm going to say it. I don't care what y'all think. Trump sucks. <laughs> He's a sexual predator. He's a literal moron. Go tattle on me to the freaking Athens. They don't give a crap. Turn off the Fox News. Do your parents listen to Fox News? I'm not going to lie. If you ask me a legit question, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it either. Because y'all need to hear the truth. <laughs> Most of y'all parents are dumber than you. I'm going to say that out loud. <laughs> My parents are freaking dumb. Okay? And the minute I figured that out, the world opens up. You don't have to do everything your parents say, and you don't have to believe everything your parents believe because most likely you're smarter than them. One of the discussions that was brought up was white privilege. Myself and a few other faculty members challenged that concept. I remember one of the instructors stating that black poverty was due to white privilege. So we challenged the idea stating that there are other variables besides just white privilege. I do remember that several other members there, mostly the teachers or instructors, did not use facts, but instead used emotions or experiences saying that we're not being very sensitive towards other people that may be experiencing this particular challenge. Recently, the Second Step program was initiated in Utah for K through 12 curriculum. One of the first things that I hear from our principal is that we're gonna be introducing a new social emotional learning curriculum called Second Steps. And, um, kind of took the wind out of my sails just a little bit, but I, I couldn't have told you why I felt uncomfortable with it. And so because I felt uncomfortable with it, I, I grabbed one of the assistant principals after that meeting and I said, I, what, what is this and, and am I gonna have to teach it? I feel uncomfortable about it. I don't know that I'm qualified to do social emotional learning. There were things in the second step program that I could not with a clear conscience teach because I felt that they were an insult and an attack 
on a child's relationship with their parents, with their grandparents, with even their family as a whole. Many of our communities have extended families and those gatherings and that engagement is very important to their cultures. But the second step program and the way it engages with all of these things, again, wordsmithed very, very well. I would say for this work to happen, we have to apply an equity lens. Actually, you know what? We just have to start seeing what it is. We don't like to say what it is because we don't like to talk about race in this country. We cannot heal our wounds if we don't tend to them. So we need to apply an equity and an anti-racist lens. So I leave you with one question, which is, how can we leverage SEL to create the social change that we need? That is not a question for you to, not just to ponder, but this is an action plan for you. What is your action plan to ensure that we leverage SEL to create the social change we so desperately need? Another thing Second Step does is they really push adult SEL. And what their plan is really is to teach the teachers first about prejudice, white privilege, white supremacy, and really get them to believe that ideology. And what they do is then turn those teachers into community organizers who then want to turn their students into social justice activists. And we, we talked about it and we prayed over it again, and I wrote a resignation letter. If in order to stay, I have to teach this, then I can't stay. If I have to do wrong to do right, I'm in the wrong place. It's an unacceptable way to live for me. And because I felt like the curriculum presented and taught wrong things, I couldn't do it. They're even requiring music teachers to teach CRT. Proponents of critical race theory advance black history and racism through the spectrum of lifelong racial oppression. Oppression that never gets better. Oppression that is tightly woven into the fabric of every non-black American. That racism is deeply planted within the legal system and all aspects of life in the United States. Oppression that requires reparations. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. <laughs> Thomas Sowell, the well-respected economist and senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, reminds us that we must be careful of propaganda. He said, it is scary how easily so many people can be brainwashed by sheer repetition of a word. Capitalism is not racist just because some people keep repeating it. Those who are most vocal about defending critical race theory and condemning the American way of life often argue that capitalism is racist and the two are interrelated. I, I classify racism and, and capitalism as these conjoined twins, right, from the same body but different personalities, different faces. And the reason why I do that is because I'm an historian. Kendi's book is only partially correct in saying the slave trade generated wealth and that capitalism is conjoined with slavery. That wealth was regionalized in the South. Accurate history records that in the early 19th century, the U.S. economy was two separate economies. Geographically, it was the North versus the South. Both free labor and slave labor existed. The North part of the United States encompassed a mostly entrepreneurial society. Industrial mills were being created everywhere. Inventors were inventing. It was an upwardly mobile society where great emphasis was placed in education. After the Civil War, the U.S. economy began to grow dramatically. It was capitalism that created new jobs and new opportunities, not slavery. The Industrial Revolution arose, competition gave power to the economy, and opportunity for job growth was maturing. 
The nation's capitalist economy was not consumed entirely with slave labor. Despite those facts, radical critics of capitalism still exist. When you talk about how America became rich, you can't separate America's riches from slavery. And the reason why America was able to become rich through slavery, which was an economic system, was because of racism. Kendi's flawed explanation between slavery and white capitalism, as he calls it, ignores refuting facts of his biased history. In 1830, nearly 320,000 blacks in the United States were free. A very large number of these free blacks were slave owners themselves. Native Americans from 1838 to 1839 owned approximately 1,500 slaves. The first legal slave owner in America was Anthony Johnson, a black tobacco farmer. The majority of slaves brought to the United States were purchased from black slave owners in Africa and elsewhere. A multiracial group of Americans worked together to eliminate slavery. Black and white abolitionists fought side by side to end the evil sufferings of human bondage. A candidate for U.S. president arose with the platform to put an end to slavery. His name was Abraham Lincoln, and he gave his life for that cause. 620,000 lives were lost during this war between the North and South, and the fact that many of these soldiers sacrificed their lives in the battle to extinguish slavery is a tribute to the fact that American institutions, governments, and whole states were fighting to secure the promise of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. After so much blood was spilt during the Civil War, America went to work to ensure that all citizens were free. Congress passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which abolished slavery, provided equal protection under the law, and secured full citizenship and voting rights for all Americans, including freed black slaves. No one can ever forget the human sacrifice America made over 150 years ago. More American lives were lost in that single war than World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. The United States fought to preserve the principle that all men are made free and that personal liberties are enshrined in the Constitution. Growing up in school, I learned a lot about America's past history. I learned about slavery, the negative aspects of what our ancestors went through, but I also learned a lot about the positive aspects and what black patriots brought to America, uh, the culture that it brought to America, and the, the fight that they also brought as far as ending slavery and where we had a lot of white allies helping us in order to be able to bring slavery to an end. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a significant piece of legislation signed into law to protect individuals against discrimination. Other laws have been enacted to eliminate race discrimination, including U.S. Code Title 42, Chapter 21, that prohibits discrimination against any person based on age, disability, gender, race, national origin, and religion. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act that prohibits creditors from discriminating against anyone who applies for credit. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act, among many others. If America was inherently racist, is it conceivable that it would work so hard to pass race discrimination laws? Simply stated, the majority of Americans don't tolerate racism in any form and are quick to call it out when recognized. I'm against critical race theory because it teaches to uh, fight racism with more racism. It's a big deal because this whole idea of pushing critical race theory is focusing on race when in fact race doesn't mean anything. 
And I know that's really hard for people to hear because we live in a society that really pushes on race. But in reality, race is physical attributes. Culture is the one that will tell us more about you and ethnicity will also tell us more about you. But race doesn't really do much for us. Some of these programs are about teaching anti-racism. Ibram Kendi, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, says that to say you're not racist is not the same as being anti-racist. You have to choose. You're either racist or you're anti-racist, and anti-racist is a complete ideology. If you, if you adopt that language, you're adopting all the things that Ibram Kendi talks about in his book, which is actually racism against white people. Under the guise of equity, proponents of Marxism and CRT teachings comes the word privilege. In a diverse society where backgrounds, parental upbringing, and socioeconomic conditions are different, the woke community of oppression adamantly embraces a narrative that privilege is harmful to an inclusive society. At Utah's Mountain Ridge High School, Facilitators lined up students for the controversial privilege walk, separating students based on identity questions. Depending on individual answers, students take steps forward, stay where they are, or take steps back. Questions like, if your parents are still married, take a step forward. You immediately instill guilt into the white kids for something they couldn't control they were born. But this is critical race theory. And that concept means that the white kids are oppressors. So critical race theory focuses on dividing people into groups, uh, deconstruction of individuals, their, their characteristics, their personality, their, their traits, their physical traits, their historical traits, maybe where they came from. There's a, some confusion with regard to this whole white, black thing and seeing race because they make everything about race as opposed to the fact that all these kids are equal no matter what their color is, that they should be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. The same teaching through separation of classes was adopted in communist China under the title of class conflict theory. It was used for the equivalent purpose, Marxist style propaganda and indoctrination, a way to control the population. In Mao's China, the uh, division um, they use is class. And Mao had his little red book called uh, Class Conflict Theory. And uh, it has the same roots as the race, uh, critical race theory. It is all Marxism. So when we were uh, in China, Mao divided the Chinese people into two opposing camps. One is the red camp. Those are for the so-called oppressed. And the other is a black camp. That's for the oppressor class. Whoever belong to the uh, black camp are condemned as class enemy. And they were deprived of their basic rights. And as kids, we know who belong to or which camp and the kids belong to the black camp were hated. We were taught to hate them. And that's exactly what I see going on here. The only difference is they use race to divide our children. And for uh, being born white, you are uh, just inherently racist. Crimes or hate towards white individuals is racism. If you do a crime towards Hispanics, that's racism. If you have hated towards any race regardless, regardless of race, that's racism. CRT is a racist perspective of life. During the 1960s, racial tension in America reached an uncomfortable plateau. Martin Luther King Jr. peacefully uttered a compelling message to all citizens regarding individual rights and liberty. 
His auspicious message still resonates today. I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. The second way that critical race theory distinguishes itself from traditional civil rights movements, which is what it tries to portray itself as in mainstream discourse, is that it's an emphasis on collectivism, on group membership, as opposed to the individualism that Martin Luther King would argue, judge a person by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. CRT is going to argue the other way, judge a person by the color of their skin based on if they belong to the oppressed race or the oppressor race. Civil rights has been at what, 57 years, give or take? And look how far we've come. Our first black president, 2008, now the vice president. I know that in Washington, they were trying to strip all of the work that my husband and I have done. Like, everything that we've done to create a happy and healthy family, they wanted to strip and reduce into oppression and to tell my son who's biracial and looks like he's white, to tell him that he should identify as his oppressed side and reject his oppressive side. I believe critical race theory was behind that, the division that's behind that leads people more into victimhood. I spent a long time in my life in that place instead of empowerment. The teachings of critical race theory in the Granite School District has long been denied, yet teachers maintain their right to bring a white athletic student to the front of the class. The teacher tells the entire class that this white male student is harmful to everyone else, based solely on the color of his skin. The teacher is proclaiming that it doesn't matter what his character is. It only matters that he is white. Therefore, he is an oppressor, planted on nothing more than the color of his skin. Utah laws with respect to education are being violated. The law expressly states that statutes always supersede rules. These five statutes include the policy for Utah's education system, civic and character education, state sovereignty, fundamental interest of all parents, and censorship of U.S. history. As also found and expressed in Utah Code 63G-16-101, in which, again, I was fortunate to author, sponsor, and pass it back in 2012. It's been in effect ever since. It's our state sovereignty statute. And therein, we fully and unconditionally reserve and affirm and assert our state sovereignty under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And under such sovereignty, there is no basis whatsoever for the federal government or federal authority to be involved in or dictating or mandating our local public education system. One of my favorite quotes is from Alexander Hamilton, dealing with state legislatures. He said, state legislatures must be not only vigilant, but jealous and suspicious guardians of the rights of the people against federal encroachment. And what astonishes me is when not only are our legislators going along with this, but they're not even suspicious. They're not even willing to show that, that they're questioning what's happening. The nice thing about what we're witnessing is, is the fact that in America, the power really is with the people. This is a government by the people and for the people. State legislators or elected officials at any level who forget that need to be reminded on occasion that they're there to protect individual rights. They're not there to protect businesses in, in their realm. They're there to protect individual rights, parents, children, education, all these things cut right to the right to the core of what what this whole debate is about. They don't want parents to understand what's going on so that we can take action. Because if they can isolate us, if they can tell the kids you're smarter than your parents, which happened this week in Utah, then they can isolate the relationship between the parents and the children. 
and they can make those children essentially wards of the state. That's the ultimate goal, is separate the parents from the children and get the children to accept that the state really has it right, that my teacher is really the authority figure. The government is required also under another statute that we wrote during my service there because of the many, many threats to parental rights by government interference, even going so far as to terminate parental rights and take a child from their parent. And in response to that, Utah Code 62A-4A-201 provides that at all times, the government must use the least restrictive means. It must do everything necessary to prevent irretrievable destruction of family life. And it must provide heightened protection to those supreme parental rights. And they must never, never treat children and parents as if they're adversaries. The worst impact of critical race theory in education, people would assume, is that it racializes students. It gets kids to think in terms of race when we've just spent 50 years in this country and longer really working very hard to get away from that because we know it's bad. Critical race theory is a name for an ideology which is identity based. It's based on race, it's based on your sexual orientation or your gender identity, but it manifests itself not with the words critical race theory across a paper or you know on a bulletin board comes in the form of curriculum. Look at the 1619 Project. It comes in the form of teacher training. And part of that is teaching them how to teach through this lens of identity and race. It also comes through propaganda that is posted all over the school. Things like BLM and pride flags and stuff like that. It comes through activities. These are activities that aren't necessarily assignments, they're activities that kids go through. For example, the privilege walk where they line up classmates on a line and then they ask them questions based on identity, based on race. And then the idea is, is you separate all these kids until you get all the white kids, especially white males up front and all those who are minority or those of color all the way in the back. Now, can you imagine what this does to relationships between students? Critical race theory is an ideology. It, it comes from, stems from Marxism, and it came from the critical legal studies. It was a framework in which they wanted to view law through race, prism of race. And they wanted to explain why there are disparities between people of colour and white people. And their conclusion is that it's because of racism. And so that was really just in the universities and it was has been taught there. However, now it's come out of the um, higher education institutions and we see the tenets of critical race theory now being filtered into schools. Critical race theorists really give themselves away by using very specialist language that you might not notice at first, but when you get used to it and you kind of understand where they're coming from, it sticks out to you. Words like equity, privilege, oppression. I mean, those are kind of big obvious ones. Intersectional, critical. You've got to always have your eyes open around the word critical. Transformative is a big word. They use these kind of words and what they're actually doing is signaling that they have a agenda built into that. Transformative is to change things through a revolutionary manner. Ryan Woods, creator of the drag persona Lady MAGA USA, questions critical race theory. He asks, is it really about racial oppression? Critical race theory sounds amazing because nobody wants racism. But what they are really about is more than discussing racism. They have incorporated LGBTQIA messages in critical race theory. And when you hear the term critical race theory, you wouldn't think that they would be talking about transgenderism and homosexuality and incorporating gender and pronouns um, into their theory and what they're teaching in school. So they're, they're very much about intersectionality and identity politics. And as a gay man and a drag artist, I have personally witnessed how toxic and how harmful identity politics and intersectionality are 
to us as Americans. Intersectionality was one of the original core principles, I would argue, from the original critical race theorists, uh, particularly uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. And she said with intersectionality that you have a individual who can say because of their sex, because of the color of their skin, they have various oppressive things or policies or people or ideas that are always there. And so you combine your where you're from, the color of your skin, your sex, and you have an intersection of oppressive things that are meant to make your life difficult, to keep you down. Christina Bogus is a well-trained Utah educator with over 21 years in education. She has multiple degrees and certifications across several states. Her recognition of CRT opens the door. The euphemisms for critical race theory are so great in number that I understand why people are confused about it. Critical race theory, usually the buzzwords are diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are big buzzwords. Bias, microaggressions, macroaggressions, microassaults, macroassaults. Everything from internal racism, internal bias, to self-reflective practices. There's lots of euphemisms for critical race theory in schools. And we're just flooded with euphemisms. And so we have words that we believe in, but they're being applied out of context and they're being misapplied. The spread of CRT is alarming elected officials in many states. Montana Attorney General Austin Knudsen. And we see a lot of times their labels keep changing. Um, so it's kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing situation in, in some of our school boards in Montana. We, we start seeing certain programs being brought in under the guise of you know, diversity, inclusivity, and of course those are important things and of course we want those things in our school and a school district is going to adopt those things and think we're, we're doing good things. The problem becomes in some of those programs and some of those curriculum when we start peeling back the layers of the onion we find out that there are some pretty pernicious school lessons being taught in there that really are flagrantly discriminatory. And that's where my AG's opinion comes in and that's what we were really trying to get at with that is that, I mean, of course we want inclusivity, we want diversity, we want to teach history, but when we start flagrantly discriminating based on race, then we've got a problem and that's illegal. And the implementation of critical race theory standards would violate the law. It, it violates the First Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which says that we cannot have compelled speech, we have freedom of speech. So we can say to a child, there are some people who say that we have systemic racism, but we cannot tell a child, you must believe there is systemic racism in order to pass this test, you must say that we have systemic racism. Yeah, well, critical race theory is just a complete anathema to the American form of government and our founding documents. It says right in our founding documents, all men are created equal. We, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. And so now we've got a theory that we're promulgating after the civil rights era, after Doc, Dr. Martin Luther King and all the huge strides we've made for equal rights and, and the Equal Protection Amendment go down the list. We're now promulgating a theory in our schools that's telling our children, no, 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 everything that we do in this country, everything we've ever done in this country is just flagrantly racist, and therefore the only way we can fix that is to treat you all differently based upon your race. Despite its appeal among political groups, teaching equity, inclusivity, and the need to treat students of color differently in our K through 12 schools, the state of Montana challenged its misleading and illegal curriculum. Two areas in federal, federal constitution and, and, and federal law that and in my opinion, critical race theory or certain portions of it violate. First of all, in, in the U.S. Constitution, 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause. All of our laws are supposed to be applied equally to all citizens in, in the country, uh, regardless of their race. And there's volumes of case law on this from the U.S. Supreme Court. A lot of the tenets of critical race theory and a lot of the, the, the lessons they teach in the classroom are flagrantly antithetical to that. I mean, they just fly in the face of equal protection at all. We're, we're, we're literally segregating kids off in different groups. We're segregating teachers off in different groups. We are grading differently based purely on race. Anti-racism training usually starts with 
about how we're not gonna ask questions. It usually starts with, we're just gonna grapple with these ideas. We're not gonna ask questions. I just need you to think about it. It almost always involves somebody speaking very softly, very um, mystically even. It It's a very interesting way that they do that. It's befuddling as a participant, especially when it's part of your job to be there. And you grapple with the ideas. You don't ask questions, you grapple. So critical thinkers who genuinely want to understand or ask the presenter or the facilitator to defend their thinking or provide evidence, that never happens. We just have to grapple. This teaching is more widely taught on college campuses across America. At Weber State, the teaching of CRT is unquestionably indoctrination. I was first introduced to principles of CRT at Weber State in my education program when, in the fall of 2020, right on the heels of the Black Lives Matter riots. So the professor had us read this textbook that talked about white privilege, and when we discussed it in class, he said that white privilege was a thing and there was going to be no discussion to the contrary. He did, however, allow a discussion that agreed with his points. Al Jackson, a former state Utah senator, is raising five biracial children. No child should be defined by their circumstances. It doesn't matter what their skin color is. These kids today need to be guided to the challenge as opposed to being patted on the head and being told that they're victims. Biracial father, Dr. Gary Thompson, living in Utah and practicing as a clinical psychologist, credits America for giving him the opportunity to achieve his lofty goal in the medical field. I'm not a victim. Uh, my dad's not a victim. My dad was one of the first crop of medical doctors to come up in the 50s and the 60s. He started a great private practice and became very wealthy. He worked hard. He's not a victim. I am not a victim. I'm one of the first, I'm the first black graduate of my doctoral level graduate school in California, and I'm not a victim. I work hard. The whole victimhood mentality thing um, bothers me. Another troubling aspect of CRT in K through 12 schools is the unelected equity committees that greatly influence what is being taught in the classroom. This group, known as the Advisory Committee on Equity and Educational Services for Students, or ACCESS, is not accountable to the general public. Sophia Anderson is the daughter of a Cuban refugee and has tried to obtain information about this group's activities. Their records should be available to the public. However, they refused and she was forced to apply for a Freedom of Information request, which had a $10,000 invoice attached to it. The Access Committee is putting on a facade of helping minorities, um, less privileged students, and what they're actually doing is rolling out the red carpet for more racism. They're pushing the CRT agenda, the social radical agenda that is so detrimental and not what we need. We need we need so much less of that, not pushing it. Children in general, they are not racist. They are not unkind to other people. But what they're what the Access Committee is doing is they're creating a problem. The Access Committee was formed in 2016 by board resolution. They're an advisory body to the board. By law, their activities, their business should be made open to the public. But for years, in fact for five years, the Access Committee operated in the shadows. Their minutes were not made available to the public and they weren't even made available to the board. In fact, just a skeleton version of their minutes were viewable by board members who were elected to represent the citizens of Utah and who have a right to know. The Murray City School District Equity Council, it was created by almost exclusively teachers and there was one parent on the Equity Council that has a gay son who she was handpicked 
No other parents were asked to be on the council and were not part of the council. Their mission essentially was dismantle systemic racism and to center the marginalized um, groups in the curriculum. And they met uh, once a month or more, um, basically in secret because no parents had been told about the Equity Council. They did have meeting minutes, which we obtained through a grammar request. And so we were able to find out a lot of what the Equity Council's mission was, what they were trying to achieve, and how they intended to go about it. But what we didn't know was that the Equity Council had uh, ad obtained the authorization of the school district to essentially act on its behalf. The school district in August of 2020 wrote a memo that basically told teachers that they needed to keep politics out of the classroom, but the Equity Council was offended by that memo, and so they wrote a new memo that said that marginalized students would be centered in the curriculum, that they believe that Black Lives Matter, and that Black Lives Matter uh, signs and symbols and LGBTQ uh, pride flags would be permitted in the classrooms and in the schools and the hallways. While critical race theory continues to proclaim equity, inclusivity, and diversity as worthy components of a healthy education, the negative effects to white children and students of color must be examined. Troubling effects on students from being taught critical race theory. It promotes victim mentality and oppressors' guilt. It fabricates animosity between races. It promotes dissension. It divides students by identity. It creates a hypersensitivity to race. Students are subject to a hostile learning culture. It spawns students' depression, confusion, and lack of self-worth. Classmates bond over perceived traumas and create unhealthy codependency around perceived abuse. Lastly, there are family issues. It places a wedge between students and their parents, particularly if they are biracial families. It is impossible, and if you try and pursue that, you will cause uh, sociological harm and you will cause psychological harm uh, to children in our community. When you dumb down your curriculum, the kids that are really, really smart, what do you do with them? Telling them that they're a victim, it's, it's not going to motivate them to want to do anything. CRT does more damage than it does good. I feel like it brings more divisiveness upon Americans. Many people deny the pernicious teachings within the critical race theory umbrella. They say it doesn't exist. Critical race theory is not taught in elementary schools or middle schools or high schools. The next resolution is 68 in support of critical race theory in public K-12 education. This resolution outlines the U.S. Conference of Mayors support for the implementation of critical race theory in public education. Are there any questions or comments on number 68? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, please verbally signal nay. The ayes have it. Critical race theory is not taught. Is not taught. What cannot be denied are the political elements that radical teachers feel they need to introduce. As parents discover the harmful effects of a shifty Marxist ideology, they're starting to push back with the help of elected officials. They demand accountability from teachers and school board members. Jake Hoffman with the Arizona House of Representatives. We don't want future generations being poisoned by a cultural Marxist philosophy like what's taught with critical race theory. What worries me today is if many teachers and administrators are teaching for social justice, I think it will lead to a very dark place, and we're already seeing it. If you're teaching a child that their worth is dependent upon the color of their skin, how can they learn to love themselves? And if they can't love themselves, how are they ever going to love their neighbor or have respect for their neighbors or for other individuals? So the idea is that all men are created equal. And so we should be using that as our paradigm or the lens through which we teach. I've made changes for my family. My kids will not be doing their core subjects at our local boundary school. They will be going to a charter school that isn't teaching things with a critical race theory lens. 
I felt like instead of teaching my child to be triumphant and how to deal with being bullied, because it's inevitable, we're all gonna be bullied, they were teaching my kid not to be a bully. Thus teaching him he is a bully because he hurt so-and-so's feeling on the playground because he said he didn't like the color pink or, or whatever. But I just felt like instead of teaching my kid reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, they were teaching my kid social topics that should be taught at home. Teacher training is an integral part of the educational system. Specific academic training is meant to help the teacher teach and assist the student in understanding subject matter. This training gives teachers the greatest chance of success. However, in the Salt Lake School District this last year, a teacher on a Zoom call was told, look, you are white and cannot speak. Sit in your discomfort. Remain silent. I am disabling your audio. That was the response after a teacher challenged the indoctrination of being anti-racist. From the transgender policy and the critical race theory, it turned into a safety issue. I'm sure you'll recall in the media there was a situation where a boy who see, says him, that he's bisexual was wearing a skirt, went into the girl's bathroom and really sexually assaulted and raped a girl. This predator was released by our Loudoun County School Board and the superintendent to go back into another school where he sexually assaulted and sodomized another girl. So that first family came out and we supported them 100% to say that this school board and these superintendent who are trying to push these, these race baiting and sexualized programs is to blame for our children getting hurt. Nicolene Peck, president of the Worldwide Organization for Women, has written 11 parenting books. Her concern regarding CRT is the material available to young students. She says parents are overlooking the danger their children are subjected to. The school's online databases. And when I say online, what I mean is you enter them online, but actually you go into a private portal. Your child is now in a private room with curated content that has been put there on purpose. So years ago, I found out that you could access really explicit content on these databases. So we're talking triple X. They were selling sex toys to children. They were promoting uh, sodomy. They were promoting BDSM, really sadomasochistic, graphic things to children. Utah State Senator John Johnson believes it's dangerous that more precaution isn't in place to safeguard the lives of young students. Our schools should be safe places for learning, not battlegrounds for divisive tribal warfare. When you're initiated into critical race theory, you become an anti-racist and you act through the presuppositions of this worldview, which plagiarizes much of Karl Marx's works. And one of those is that racism is everywhere and it's unavoidable. Uh, another one is that the white man is utterly incapable of racially righteous actions unless he has an interest, interest convergence. Uh, another one is knowledge is socially constructed and therefore there are no objective truths. So the, the worldview causes great confusion because what, what a, a traditional person or a normal person would view as self-evident truths, critical race theory challenges because they believe that that knowledge is socially constructed as opposed to self-evident. Neferi's attempts to indoctrinate children through various means of propaganda is an effort to circumvent the responsibility of parenthood. LeVar Christensen says that responsibility is obvious. The law has been written. Parents have fundamental responsibility for the education of their children, that the cultivation of an informed and virtuous citizenry from one generation to the next is essential to the public virtue and well-being of our state and nation. The school has so much influence in my children's lives and that the parents are not aware unless we are constantly reviewing curriculum and being incredibly involved that we can't trust that our children are safe in these schools. When you expose what's truly at the heart of CRT and how it is, is a dividing force, not a unifying force, that it, why it's so important that we fight it, but that 
it's, it's, a, it's the good fight and that we can bring people together. Parents are exhausted in fighting this controversial curriculum in their children's schools. They have been labeled domestic terrorists by the Attorney General of the United States. Their efforts to turn back the harmful effects of critical race theory have all but been ignored. As Christopher Rufo pointed out, there are three parts to a successful strategy to defeat the forces of critical race theory. Governmental action, grassroots mobilization, and an appeal to principle. Once I had started doing research and I understood what was in the unit and I was very opposed to what they were teaching, I started reaching out to the teachers and the principals and even up to the school board. First I started with the teacher and she and I did not agree on what was controversial or what was bias. And so at that point, since we couldn't come to an agreement that this curriculum was um, biased and very controversial, then I went to the principal. And I had multiple emails and phone conversations with this principal about the unit, going through point by point over quotes, vocabulary words, things that I found objection objectionable, and she just didn't see it my way either. Utah Parents United was encouraged to collect letters from parents about what's happening in the schools. So we could take them to Sydney Dixon, the state superintendent, and show her what's going on. So as we put out the call, we got hundreds of letters from parents, and they were very well written, documented, well thought out. They were brilliant. And so before um, we went to give them to Sid Dixon, I sat down and I read through those letters and it actually brought me to tears. One of the main reasons it brought me to tears is because it felt so heavy on my shoulders. I'm just a mom in my kitchen reading these letters. And why am I the one reading them? It's because there's no oversight. These parents did go up the chain. They talked to the teacher, they talked to the principal, they talked to the superintendent. They called the USB E hotline and nothing happened. The principal assured us that action would be taken, that changes would be made. Elle went to the class on Monday and nothing was changed. Everything was still the same. He was there, so I immediately took her out of the class. And so here I am, here UPU is, on their shoulders with the weight of what was happening because no one else was listening printed the letters up, put them in a binder, and handed them, I handed them to Sid Dixon. And I said, will you please read every single one of these? And she said, yes, I promise. And so she read through the letters, and then um, she said I, she made four ideas about what she's gonna start teaching schools, which were great, you know, transparency, vetting the curriculum, being um, developmentally appropriate. She had these great ideas that she was gonna start telling districts as a solution. But then she began to go tell schools that, yes, I've read through all the letters and there is no CRT in the letters. We're coming to this point where people can't communicate. We're ruining relationships. In my experience, I can clearly see that this ideology of critical race theory isn't good for anybody. It's not going to help uh, our communities. It's not gonna help our friendships. It's not gonna help our families. It's something that we have to stop. And we have to remember that we're all good people, that we all want the right things uh, for America, for each other. We don't hate each other um, until we start talking about critical race theory. If successful attempts are made opposing critical race theory, its teachings, its instructions, its methods must be addressed politically on all levels. Critical race theory is a kind of snake oil. So what's a snake oil? It's a fake medicine that you sell to somebody. You tell them they're sick, right? So you tell everybody society's racist and you sell them a medicine that doesn't make them better, it makes them sicker. The solution to, to snake oil is to stop taking it. In this documentary, experts in the fields of education, psychology, politics, and other disciplines have exposed critical race theory and uncovered its Marxist agenda. It is the radicalization and renorming of American history. The basis for one to support such teaching is to maintain a misguided and false narrative of America's imperfect but great history. 
CRT shamefully teaches identity politics, which rejects the inspired and fundamental ideals in which this country's founding fathers distill personal liberty. It's time for us as a legislature to step up and pass meaningful legislation that gets us back to a point where we are united as a community rather than divided against each other. This is a great nation. It's a great, powerful country. The only way we can be destroyed as a nation is if we are divided from within. We have examined CRT's genesis. We have uncovered the devious tactics used by school board administrators, teachers, and unelected equity groups. They have hammered through a delusive educational curriculum, all the while denying their actions and motives. Introducing young students who haven't even reached puberty about sexual matters and conjoining this under the critical race theory umbrella. This is proof the curriculum isn't only about equity, inclusivity, and diversity. It is about politically indoctrinating young minds, changing history, tribal separation, and forwarding a false narrative about sexual identity. We have heard from educators and school board members who have seen the harmful effects of critical race theory. And so we plead with our Utah state legislators and I, I esteem them, I have served with them, and we need you now. CRT is a perspective of gender identity which more closely identifies with critical theory. Philosophical work from the 1930s where Max Horkheimer a devout Marxist promoted the idea that there is oppression between economic classes, race, feminism, and gender, or sexual components, are conveniently cloaked in this perspective. Because intersectionality is about any minority group that is perceived to suffer from some form of oppression. In one year, 50 years of planning is falling you know, right in the garbage for them. There's a ton of reason for hope. It's very easy to push back. They don't have the argument. They don't have the evidence. They don't have the moral high ground. They just pretend to have all those things. All it takes is being able to see what it is, realize that it's important and that you do have to show up and fight. You can't sit it out and wait for it to blow over. It won't blow over. And then they have no defense. This critical perspective has no authentic truth, value, or core belief in which we can base society. Its intended progeny throws the traditional understanding of man, woman, and marriage out the window. There's no country, no place in this world that I'd rather live than in the United States of America because of those opportunities. I am a first-generation immigrant. My kids now have so much opportunities that they would have in no other country because my, country, my, my parents immigrated to this country and have now been given some opportunities that we would never have in Peru where I'm from or a country's from where other people might immigrate from. I'm very, very optimistic. I see something happening. Exactly what course we end up taking to get there, I think it's probably too early to tell, but I'm very optimistic that the legislature has the appetite to take this issue up and to do what's right for Utah children. Critical race theory is here. It is being taught in Utah, across the United States, and throughout the world. The question is, what are we as parents, teachers, and elected officials going to do about it? To stop the historical lies that extinguish the will of students to succeed while being called oppressors or victims? Will we allow the radical political teaching an ideology based on tribal racism to overturn an American way of life by revolutionaries? To quote Helen Keller, a woman who could not see, nor hear, but understood so much, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Racism is fear because you don't yet have understanding. And if we stay in a perpetual state of fear without seeking conversations and seeking to know someone one-on-one, -on -one, we are perpetuating racism. We have cited so many statutes in Utah code 
And yet the only thing that we're faced with is administrative rules that the state office and the state board, with even with the best of intentions, they have adopted, but they are in violation of and they contradict the multiple statutes that we have referenced in the Utah Education Code. We stand by them, we exercise them, we uphold them, they shall prevail. The rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. That the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Any school in America teaching critical race theory, its concepts in principle or by practicum, espousing the need to separate students based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin is in federal violation of the First Amendment, which protects citizens from compelled speech. The 14th Amendment, which provides equal protection under the law, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits public institutions from discriminating on the basis of race. No people will tamely surrender their liberties, nor can any be easily subdued when knowledge is diffused and virtue is preserved. Samuel Adams. One thing that I've tried to instill in my kids and in others around me is that the gratitude that I feel as an immigrant to this country, and that's why I want to give back. That's why I want to speak out. That's why I, I say, no, this is not a good thing. This is a bad thing to teach our kids that America is not this great country, because it is. We have our faults, but I still believe in American exceptionalism. I believe that our Constitution is of divine origin. And I believe that it, when we can teach our kids their unlimited potential, instead of trying to pit one race against the other or divide us, then that's when we forget how grateful we should be about a country that gives us so many opportunities and so many rights. And race is only a small part of who we are. Now, it's okay to recognize that somebody's a different color than you, that's okay. That's the beauty of us as Americans. That, that's what makes us the most cosmopolitan country in the world and the least racist, in my opinion, in the world, where you've got people of color who are trying to get here from all parts of the world because of the opportunity and because of the ideals upon which this nation has been founded. But then you've got others on the other side who want to divide us by race. The United States of America is the best country that has ever been built in the whole entire world, in, in the world of history. One thing I, I admire about the Founding Fathers is that they had this concept that in order to form a more perfect union, they knew that back then the United States was not a perfect union, but they created the framework. They created these 50 laboratories. They gave power and control to the states. That is where parents can have a, a greater effect on what is taught in the schools because they can lobby, they can talk to their representatives, to their senators, to their governor. I became a, a citizen of the United States just a few years ago and I took that very seriously. I wanted to learn about America, its history, the Constitution, why the freedoms that we have here are important and how they came to be. And as I learned about these things, I really gained an appreciation and a love for the Constitution, for the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. We're all just fighting for freedom and what's right and the love for our country. This great nation we call America is founded upon the core principle that we are all children of God, created equal in His sight. No individual stands above another, 
and all are endowed with unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These values were put into the lifeblood of America more than 200 years ago. We must never let the flame of truth and liberty be extinguished, and we must never forget our true history, our mistakes, our challenges, our progress, and the sacrifice of so many men and women who came before to bless all Americans with the freedoms we enjoy today. The time is now, and the duty is ours to protect our children and preserve what our forefathers built. <laughs>